aware of, we're talking specifically about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was passed at the end of 2017. Um, some of it was retroactive, effective in 2017. For example, the medical deduction um, threshold the, the went from 10% to 7.5. That was uh, retroactive. Some of the uh, uh, provisions on deductibility uh, under Section 179, big equipment deductions were going back to, uh, to September. That fun stuff. But as of uh, uh, last night, we had proposed regulations, and if you guys know the tax, how the tax laws work, the IRS sometimes interprets the tax laws in something called regs. They have yet to issue the regs on the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, they did some proposed regs under Section 199, and I've already had three people ask questions about that stuff uh, as we, just in the first two minutes. So I, you know, again, we'll we'll get back to it. We have a ton of questions coming through, so you might have to ask again, but we will get to these. Um, and so we're still deciphering it. It was only 100, and I think it was 170 pages that they issued yesterday. Uh, and they do give some examples. What they did is, is shut some loopholes that some uh, tax practitioners were trying to exploit by using tons of trusts and things like that. And they shut that door, which was very predictable, but some people made some money in the, in the short term on, on, at the expense of their clients. Um, and so we're going to go through all these things. I can, again, Brian, Alexa, I can see tons of questions coming in. You got very good ones, and we're going to be uh, knocking them. Tonight, though, what we're going to be focusing on um, is kind of uh, what's the good, the bad, and the ugly, and specifically, why are people so freaked out by uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in certain states? And you'll understand why. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to start at the very basics, which is uh, what is uh, itemizing and why is it important. Uh, we're going to go over what is the, and you're going to have to, you're going to have to decide for yourself because I'm going to give you a bunch. But what is the single most devastating law change? Uh, the three things that the top 2% do differently and where I can learn more, like how can I actually keep apprised of what the changes are. Um, obviously, you know that uh, you can always talk to us, but I'm going to give you some specific places that you can go and specific ways that you can learn so you don't miss anything. Uh, this will have an impact on you, period. Uh, the, the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act will have an impact on you. So we're going to start off uh, right on the what is itemizing and why is it important. And uh, in order to, to understand itemizing, you have to know what it is, which is an individual. Um, these are it's applicable to individuals, so not to businesses. You list out what deductions you're entitled to and compare it to the standard deduction. That little standard deduction is what you're going to hear a lot about. If the itemized deductions are more, you take them as opposed to the standard deduction. Um, technically, you could go back in and, 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 and take the standard deduction, even if it's less, but they're going to want to know why. Uh, but we're not going to get into all the minutia. Uh, somebody doesn't have sound, the sound is coming through for everybody else. So you may want to uh, either go onto a phone line or try going over it. Do the opposite of whatever you're doing. It's either going to be, uh, if you're on a phone, do computer audio. If you're doing computer audio, do phone. Uh, so let's go into all this fun stuff. What are the questions you should ask? So if somebody says, hey, you get to write certain things off, then the first thing that I'm going to want to know uh, more than likely is what is included in the calculation. Uh, in other words, how do I figure out what my standard deduction is and uh, uh, what is it comprised of? The other thing is, uh, what is my standard deduction? Or I shouldn't say, what is my standard deduction in the beginning? Is what is what is my itemized deductions? How much can I write off? What things can I write off? And then the next question is, what is my standard deduction? So we start with the what is included in the calculation, and then we shoot over to my standard. And then the real question for you is, do I receive any benefit? Like, what is what is the net for me? So let's kind of start off with, with each one of these. I'm going to go through them check by check, because that's just the way I, am. I like to go through. And uh, we got to figure out what's in the, uh, in, in the calculation. And the way you're going to do that is we're going to go to old Schedule A of your 1040. So when you file a 1040, and by the way, I'm going to show you the, the drafts of all these things. But when you go to your 1040, you have this thing called a Schedule A. This is the 2017 up here. So I'm going to kind of just circle the 2017. This is the proposed 2018. And as you can see, it says draft. It's July 10th, which means the IRS is putting these things out. They get comment on them. And eventually, they're going to come up with the actual form we're going to use. But we can kind of see what they're thinking. Uh, what we know for sure is this this old uh, right here, 
that is what was retroactive. So we know that the medical deduction, if you ever call up the IRS and say, hey, can I write things off uh, for medical and dental? The answer is going to be yes, but it has to exceed your adjusted gross income by that amount. And so it used to be 10%, and then it went back down to 7.5. And it, you know, to be historical, it used to be less, then it went up, then it went back down. They're always moving it around, and it's a pain. But all that means is that if I make 10000 or or $100,000, the first $7,500 of my medical expenses, I cannot take. So if I have $10,000 of medical expenses, I get 2500 and that goes on my line item here. So what it means is that it's part of my calculation. So I'm just going to write down, let's just say that we have 2500 I then go to taxes paid, and this is a big one, guys, and I'll go into specifics on this, but what you don't see here, this is 2017 versus here, is you're gonna see a little thing, and I don't expect you to be able to see it, but I'm gonna tell you what it is. It is a $10,000 cap. So your state and local taxes, as we call that SALT, and you're gonna see that it is now a $10,000 limit, and you're gonna understand why that's important, why people are freaking out. Um, people are going to be uh, a little bit upset. Somebody says they can't see my screen. Everybody else can see it. So it's going to be a computer issue. You may want to restart. Um, the interest, this is another one. This is your mortgage interest. Oh, and by the way, when you're doing the state and local taxes, you can see by looking at the little form, state and local income tax, state and local real estate. And state and local personal property tax and you add those up and you're limited to ten thousand dollars as a married couple if you're not married you're single then it's five thousand you can see that number right down here i will go through these things in greater um and i'll explain and i'll answer all your questions but this is part of the calculation so you would normally have a number that goes here and we're going to see why that's important especially for you folks uh, I think the hardest hit state is New York. Um, then we look at interest paid, and this is for your home home uh, mortgage. And what they did here is they put a limit from one million to seven hundred and fifty thousand. And so you would just add up, and you'd figure out what your home mortgage is, and you'd add it, and you'd add that line up there. This is all part of your itemized. Um, this amount now they do this calculation, and there's two things that we have to be aware of. First off, we're now limited to $750,000 of indebtedness, and it has to be a certain type of indebtedness. It has to be for the acquisition. Actually, let me see if I can spell that right. It's the acquisition or improvement. It's called acquisition indebtedness. And what that means is that if you did, like they're actually gonna put it right up here, to buy, build, or improve your home. In other words, if I pull money out of my house to pay for my kid's college, I cannot write that the interest off on that anymore. And again, every time you hear one of these things, you're going to realize that we have a solution. That's why, you're, that's why you're listening. We then go to gifts to charity, and they used to have a limitation of 50% of your adjusted gross income. Let me just butcher that. 50%. It is now... 60% of your adjusted gross income, which means you can give substantially more. Um, and by the way, someone just asked, isn't the mortgage interest on old mortgages still a full write-off? Uh, kind of. The amount, the one million you're grandfathered in at, if you had indebtedness prior to December 15th, 2017, or if you were under contract and you closed your your your, your loan before April of 2018, excuse me, April 15th of 2018. So if you were right in the process of, of refining, then you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna be able to go up to the 1 million. Um, but it's still the acquisition indebtedness. I'm not aware of any grandfathering in to not have indebtedness, but that's why they do regs and they let us know how they're gonna enforce this thing. Uh, casualty and theft losses used to be pretty basic. If, if you had it, you got to write it off, um, but now, it has to be a federal disaster area. So you folks that have been impacted by the fires, the hurricanes, all this, um, then uh, then you're going to be able to write 
stuff, the, the casualty and theft losses. Uh, someone just asked a question. And uh, Rogerio, I'm, I'm going to butcher your first name. Um, the answer to yours is yes. What about pulling money out of your home as a second mortgage to buy a rental property? So you're already getting ahead of us. And you're genius, because that's exactly how I want you to think. Um, you want to be <laughs> thinking the way that, that you're thinking. Yes, you can write it off, but you'd be writing it off on a different schedule. You'd actually be writing it off on Schedule E. In other words, you're not going to try to write it off as a home mortgage a deduction. You're going to write it off as an investment expense on the uh, uh, interest expense on your, um, on your Schedule E income, on your rental income. Um, somebody says they got kicked out. Will it be archived? Yes, I'm going to record this and make this available to you guys all. Um, and so somebody said we did this in uh, December 2017. Good because uh, you're right there. Um, other itemized deductions, you're gonna see this. See this little thing in 2017 where it says other miscellaneous deductions? Um, and you're gonna realize that they changed that little language. That's because there are no more miscellaneous deductions. And yes, I said that right, they're gone. The one good thing they did is they took away the, uh, if you used to make too much money, they would have a limit on how much you can take and that's gone. I think that was called a P's limitation. Now that's gone. So there's no more limit. So you can make a ton of money and still get your Schedule A deductions. But what you see with all these limitations, it's gonna be tough to go over the Schedule A amount. Um, just to give you guys an idea of what the tax returns are gonna look like, this is a, Again, a draft, and you can see it's pretty recent, as of July 31st. This is a draft of what your of what your 1040 is going to look like. It's going to have a page one and a page two. So page one, you can see it's basically your personal information. They said we're going to fit this thing on a postcard. And uh, here's your page two. And on the page two, you're going to see we have the little standard deduction and uh, or itemized deductions from Schedule A. And then you're gonna see something else here that, that's new. It's this line here, line nine. And this is called QBI. And that is a 20% deduction on pass-through income. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit, uh, but that's gonna be a big one. That's the one that they just gave us the proposed regulations on yesterday. And uh, it's a lot of fun there. They're gonna, it's a, like 170 pages, I think, at the, at the minimum. I should pull it up and just show you guys how they write, make your mind go numb. All right, so the reason I wanted to show you that is just to give you some indication of what they're trying to accomplish. So, it, well, you know, when I say they, it's, it's, it's the Trump administration, but you also have the IRS trying to interpret this and how they're going to collect their money. Um, they're trying to simplify it, and in doing so, it's going to have an effect on you. Um, Someone just asked, I'll get into all your other questions, guys. You guys have some fun ones. Um, we're gonna see more and more, we're gonna see more and more impact, but I want you guys to understand when they when they simplify things, what's, what's the actual impact? Uh, and the reason that uh, this is relevant for you is because of what they did to this next section. So we already looked at our Schedule A and we said, all right, now we know we have charitable gifts, we have medical expenses that exceed a certain amount. We have mortgage interest. Um, we have, uh, what else do we have on there? We have the interest paid, we have our salt. And if there's any other uh, itemized deductions, which miscellaneous itemized are gone, but they still have a line. I don't know what else would be there. There might be something hiding or federal disaster casualty loss. That's what makes up your Schedule A. Otherwise, you're gonna use the standard deduction, which is now for a single person, $12,000. For married filing jointly, $24,000. So they really jumped these up. And I'm gonna show you what the numbers look like uh, here in a second. So what it looks like is they went from a single filer getting uh, 6,350 to 12,000. And what this is versus Schedule A. 
So Schedule A is your itemized deduction. So you always have to look and say, which one's more? And I hope you guys are already seeing that if we have all these things that are part of Schedule A and I don't get any benefit for them, and that does not include uh, medical expense, if you're paying for the health insurance, I think so. But otherwise, no. And I'm going to show you there's, there's always a better way. I hate going on this Schedule A, and I'll show you why. The standard deduction is so huge. And the numbers uh, that we're looking at is actually going to be pretty significant as to whether it's going to affect you at all. You're going to have to run a calculation. You're going to have to, like, I can take a look at your last year's Schedule A and say whether you're going to be affected just by running it through and saying, hey, wait a second, here's the, here's the limitations that we're going to put. So if you're in a, if you're in a property tax state, where, excuse me, a high property tax and a high income tax. So, you know, I think the, the, there's actually four states that filed suit uh, this last, uh, in the last month against the federal government trying to get rid of that SALT limitation, which they're going to lose. Um, but there's a bunch. I think it was uh, Maryland, uh, uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I know that those are big ones. Um, but what it means in English uh, is that right now, currently, we have about 46 million taxpayers who itemize. In other words, they're taking the Schedule A. And here's the estimate, um, 13 million. So you're talking about, uh, you may fall into that category of, what is this, 33 million? No longer itemize. And when I say tax, tax Tax-mageddon, you have to understand all of these things have an impact. It's not just, hey, I saved some money, but you incentivize certain types of behaviors. And if nobody, so all of a sudden, what behaviors do we just remove from incentive? You ready? I'm going to go back to it just because I feel like it. These behaviors, what did we just take away from having an incentive? Being charitable, um, paying state and local taxes. In other words, all of a sudden, I don't get to write off my high property taxes. Maybe I'm not going to buy as nice a house. Mortgage interest, all of a sudden I'm capped. So am I going to buy? This is funny. Some of this asks, are short-term trading commissions written off in Schedule D or Schedule E? Neither. Commissions are usually added to basis. Um, but anyway, just answer your question real quick. All right, so we have the big difference. And why is this so huge? It's going to impact certain people much more significantly than others. Just think of, and I just want you to think for a quick second, who is this going to impact? Think about the people who benefit from the incentivized. What about student loan interest that's still, I didn't see it on your schedule. A. I think it's still deductible up to like the uh, $2,500 amount. Uh, they didn't do anything with it that I'm aware of. Go back to this. So by now you now know what itemizing is and why it's important. First off is because um, if we itemize and there's certain expenses, we have to hit a pretty big threshold. For example, if you are mailing, uh, married filing jointly, your Schedule A has to be greater than 24000 for you to get a dollar of benefit. If you give to your charity, let's say that you have um, some real estate taxes of $5,000, you have mortgage interest of $5,000, and you give $10,000 to charity, you know what benefit you get out of all of that? It's $20,000 and you're married filing jointly, your net benefit for all of that is zero. This is why it's significant. We've just disincentivized a whole bunch of different behaviors. So what should we expect? We should expect people aren't gonna be as incentivized to go out there and buy houses. We should expect that people aren't as incentivized to give money to charities. And you're gonna see the numbers, it's gonna freak you out. Because uh, I know that charities are freaking out. Uh, is that good? No. So, yeah, depends on where you live. So what they're estimating is that uh, how many people are going to have their taxes go up, go down. I mean, for the most part, everybody's going to get a tax deduction underneath this new act, unless you live in a high tax state, and then you're going to see a chunk of your, you're going to see your taxes go up. So if you're in like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Maryland, chances are California, there's a good chance your taxes are going to go up or, or stay pretty close to the same. So here we go. What are the big chances? Yeah, somebody's like New York. Yeah, you're pretty much, I'll show you the numbers. I'll show you how it looks. I did a quick comparison for some taxpayers. Uh, big changes, you're going to have to choose on what are the big changes, what's the single most devastating change to the tax laws. 
Um, and the reason I'm going to say you're going to have to choose because there's a bunch of them that are that that have affected. So I like to do the going, going, gone. Miscellaneous itemized deductions are gone. And uh, if you don't know what those are, that's uh, expenses related to investments in the production of taxable income, amongst a whole bunch of other stuff. But this is big. Anybody here who trades and you have expenses and you don't qualify as a full-time business in trading, like if you don't qualify as a trader, which that's been a moving target for 20 something years, um, you no longer get to write off your investment advisory fees or expenses or clerical help or expenses for your home office or the depreciation of your computer, the fees to collect interest and dividends, uh, even, uh, even things like safe deposit box, although I don't think any of you guys are going to have that. Uh, will you make the slides available? Absolutely. Um, then we have a whole bunch of other ones. So things like uh, what are big ones that are going to impact you? <laughs> um, tax preparation fees, <laughs> uh, in indirect miscellaneous itemized deductions. Uh, here's where it comes in. If you have a disregarded LLC, for example, and it's paying a C Corp to manage it, normally you would take that on your Schedule A. Gone is that. You can't do that. You can't write off computers anymore. Not on your Schedule A. Not as a miscellaneous itemized expense. So this begs the question then. Do you want your expenses flowing on Schedule A? The, you should all be saying no. Then the next question is, if you're, if, if you're paying a corporation, would the expenses we pay the corporation, like if we paid a fee, does that go on your Schedule A? If the answer is yes, then we need to change that. And it's it's kind of a, a case by case. If it's real estate, you don't have to worry. If it's trading like stock trading, you have to worry. What we need to do is change that to a, to a partnership and I'll show you how that works. Don't worry guys, I have the solutions. We have lots of solutions in our, in our toolbox. So here's kind of the things we gotta look at. I like using charts. I like looking at things that I can summarize and make sense to me. So in the stock option investing, your expenses typically go on your Schedule A. This is what just went away. So we don't want to have this, but this is where they would normally go. This is why we have to be very cognizant of these types of activities, stock and option. If you're in trader status, your expenses go on your Schedule C, but as many of you guys know, you have about a 700% higher audit rate than if you do through the corporation. Um, Forex, same thing, expenses if you're doing the 1256, but if you make a 988 election, if you don't know what that means and you're in Forex, we need to have a chat because you actually get to choose. You don't have to do a formal, I think you just basically make a notation on your return. Uh, you would get your expenses on 988. But again, I try to avoid this line, this Schedule C, because of this, that 700% more likelihood to get it audited. And then futures, goes on Schedule A. Crypto goes on Schedule A. If you're doing Forex and you're doing uh, contracts, uh, futures contracts in Forex, then it's 1256, which is a 60-40 split between long-term gain and short-term. Don't try to follow me if you don't know what this stuff is. Um, it's gonna have a, a minor, like th this is really good. We love this. We want your stuff to flow. Like if you see it landing on here, we still want it to. We just want to avoid these. So uh, I'll show you how to do that. We use a corporation to do that. And then in real estate, shouldn't affect you at all. Shouldn't affect you at all as long as you actually have rental properties, as long as the Schedule E is uh, where you get your K-1s from your, uh, from your uh, S corporations, uh, where you get your K-1s out of certain estates and trusts, where you get your K-1 off of partnerships and where your rents and royalties flow. So um, and let's say, can you still deduct computers for a first year business organizational cost? Um, the answer is not as an organizational cost, but as a startup cost. And the answer is yes, but I wouldn't put it there. I would make it a section 162 ordinary necessary business expense and just reimburse yourself. We will get into that because that, that is what the rich folks do. Um, before we get into what the rich folks do, we gotta understand what we're gonna lose if we don't do it right. All of these are no longer, no longer on Schedule A. If you know a teacher or somebody who's paying out of their pocket for their employment, they've lost all their deductions. And this is a Schedule A is a 1040. It does, it is a 1040 
Schedule A miscellaneous, it's it, it your itemized deductions. So it's not for a corporation. So you cannot write these off if you're an individual and you have your expenses going under your Schedule A. So what should you do? You should look at your last year's tax return and look at your Schedule A. Those numbers will tell you what you're going to lose. Uh, <laughs> where you aren't rich, that's where you come in. I like that. We will help you. And rich is, uh, is different, means different things to different people. Some people, it's just the freedom. Um, and let's see, does Schedule E still apply if I have two rental properties but no entities? Yes. So as long as you have them properties, then we're good. And that's what we care about. Um, if you don't have the properties, then we have to use a different type of, uh, of business. And, uh, and again, what really comes down to is when do you become an active business? And so sometimes we use a C Corp. All right. So options. You have two choices. And you guys already know this because you've been through our courses, because you've been around us. You know, you can either qualify individually as an active business, which stinks. And by, in order to do this, if you are an investor, that means you have to be a trader or a dealer. We don't like either one of those. And the other route is we just create a business structure. And that's our preferred route because when we go to the because we go when we go to the business structure, there's other ancillary benefits. And if there's one winner, huge winner in this whole thing uh, from the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it's gonna be your friend, the corporation. And that is because that corporation just got its 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 taxes eliminated. Uh, or not completely limited, but, but like cut in half. I'll show you how it, how it works. So the first one is an investment business. If you're an investment business, so this is stocks, bonds, futures, Forex, anything where you're doing uh, some passive activities, you want to make sure that it's taxed as a partnership. This is a form 1065, and the reason that you're doing this is because you want to be able to pay the corporation out of profit or out of a guaranteed payment to partner, which just means I paid it and it's a partner. And the reason being is because once that happens, it comes off the top, the expense no longer flows under your personal return. So for example, if I make $100,000 in my investments and I do nothing, that flows onto my 1040 Schedule D. If I pay $20,000, excuse me, and that's if I'm a 100% owner, let's just pretend the corporation's not there, then that would just flow through. Now let's pretend that the corporation has a 10% stake in the business. Then now I would get, boom, only 90% of that or 90,000 and $10,000 would flow up into the corporation where it can expense it and do whatever it wants. Now it can do all the expenses. If it doesn't have enough money, then I can pay it a guaranteed payment. I can say, oh, you need to get paid $1,000 a month. So let's pay it $12,000 in addition. What that does is it allows me to deduct the $12,000 off of my 90, which gets me, what is that, um, 78. So then I would only have $78,000 flow onto my 1040. And now I would have this plus this, I would have $22,000 in my corporation. And before you freak out and you said, hey, uh, boy, you, uh, I have, I have, I have $22,000 in my company. Boy, this is going to stink. I heard my, my accountant said double tax. Went, Chill out. Because the double tax used to be bad. It used to be bad about, uh, what is it, probably 15 years ago. What, what it is now is you pay tax at the corporate rate. You know what the corporate rate is now? Here, see if anybody knows. Um, and somebody could say, are we talking about a C-Corp for an LLC? LLC is not taxed. An LLC chooses how it's taxed. Um, so a, an LLC can be taxed as a C-Corp, an S-Corp, a partnership, or whatever. So uh, that investment business, this could be an LLC taxed as a partnership, which means it's filing a 1065. This could be an LLC taxed as a 1120, as a corporation. All right, you guys are guessing. Lots of people. There's 15, 21, da da, da 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 What about FICA taxes in a corp? It does not exist because uh, corporations don't pay social security. They don't retire. They live forever. All right. So uh, so what we do is we, we make money in the LLC. It pays the corporation reasonable managed fees and profits. The corporation pays the expenses, but it pays 21%. So those of you who said 21% are right. It is a flat. Whether it makes $10 million or $10, 
the tax on the corporation is now 21%, period. What if it pays it out to you? What if you lose your mind and you say, I'm gonna pay out dividends just because I wanna see how that's done? Then you are taxed when you're the shareholder and you get dividends, it's called qualified dividends. Dividends are taxed at, ready? Long-term capital gains. And if you know what long-term capital gains are taxed at, it is zero to 20%, depending on your how much you make. If you are making less than $70,000, for example, it's gonna be zero. It doesn't pay anything in tax. So do you pay FICA if you get paid by the corp? Only if you take out a salary. If you take out uh, dividends, you do not. If the corporation just makes money, it does not. If the corporation just gives you fringe benefits. And so the way to look at it is whenever, whenever you have a corporation, it pays compensation. And compensation includes, this is where accountants screw it up all the time, wages, fringe benefits, and other bonuses and things like that. So what I care about are the wages, that would be subject to FICA or Social Security, whatever you wanna call it, old age, death and survivors and Medicare. Or if it pays me fringe benefits, the rule is, unless it's an exception, I have to pay tax on it. So if, if, a, if a corporation buys me a house, I have to pay tax on the value of the house. If the corporation buys me a brand new BMW, I have to pay tax on the value of the BMW. But if the corporation reimburses my miles on my BMW, I do not have to pay tax. If the corporation provides, let's say this is a C Corp, I put C Corp, and it has a medical reimbursement plan and it pays $50,000 for my family for all of its medical and dental and vision expenses for the year. I have somebody that got sick and I came out of pocket 50 grand. My corporation can literally reimburse $50,000 and I pay zero in tax. If the corporation reimburses a, a, a partial use of my home as a home office, zero. I don't report it anyway. The corporation gets to write it off. That is a fringe benefit. If it wants to, if it says, "Hey, you need to have a cell phone so that because uh, we're doing business all the time, we're doing real estate deals all over the place," you got it. You're now an employee. You got to have a cell phone. It can reimburse your entire cost of your cell phone. You have zero tax. So can a sole proprietorship, single member disregard LLC still deduct trading commissions on stocks and crypto? So no, you cannot, but you don't typically deduct the commissions. I think they're usually as a transactional cost, they're added into the cost basis of the stock. But um, again, uh, we're not gonna worry about this stuff. That's peanuts compared to what we're talking about. The, the, what we're really talking about is the ability to move our money so that we control where it's taxed and when it's taxed. And so if we have a very simple structure, I can decide how much money I'm gonna be pushing up in that structure so long as I have it documented and so long as it's reasonable. And before you freak out about reasonable, understand that we have people going in front of Congress all the time saying um, $14 million is reasonable compensation. Now you're supposed to compare it to others in that industry, but just think about what it would cost you to hire someone to run your business. Uh, it's going to be usually significantly less than what you're charging it. And you're still, you're going to be the nervous Nelly. It just doesn't happen. Uh, do these numbers apply to an S Corp as well? Not on the medical reimbursement, but everything else, yes. Um, and uh, the uh, S Corporation is taxed to its shareholders at their level. So you don't have the 21%. You do get something else though with an S Corp. And that is you get a 20% deduction and that's called the Qualified Business Income Deduction, which I'll get into here in a second. All right, another example, let's say we do the same thing, we have an investment business, but we also have some real estate. So remember that investment business has to be taxed as a partnership, that corporation can, needs to be a partner and it gets ownership, so if it's, if it's a 20% partner, it gets 20% of, um, of the profits. Um, I, can, I can pay it a, a reasonable management fee, and I can jump it up to the corporation where it either expenses it out. If we keep it in the corporation, it pays 21% on profit. I'm just gonna say a C Corp here just because that's what I tend to use. Uh, I need to have another taxpayer. Even if I'm expensing everything out and I get to zero, then it doesn't really matter. I'm not using an S Corp in this type of structure. 
um, you'd have to twist my arm. Um, then I'm also going to have a real estate holding company. And this one, it doesn't matter whether it's disregarded or a partnership. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I really care about is that it's real estate and it can own all of its little sub LLCs. So if I have a real estate holding entity, you guys know I'm probably going to put it in Nevada or Wyoming just to keep it out of harm's way in your state. And then you may have different state LLCs. So for example, I may have a Georgia LLC, I may have a Tennessee LLC, and I may have a Texas LLC. Um, and then this LLC is just Wyoming. It's cheap and because nobody can take it from me. Um, and I do that. That's example of how I can run the money. This guy can pay if I want to. This guy can pay if I want to. And just remember, this is a flat 21% on profit. If I can expense it out, um, uh, then, then I'm going to do that. Somebody asked, if I have a loss in a C-Corp, can I carry it forward? Yes, up to 20 years. Um, uh, do I have to pay myself W-2 salary if I own an S-Corp? It depends on if you make money. If you make money, then yes. Somebody else said something about having some uh, uh, large education expenses. What about training? Yes, you can write that off so long as you have an active business. The reason that we do this is so because you can never write off education, commission, or excuse me, like uh, conferences, seminars, and things like that in an investment business. You never can. It has to be at the corporate level. But the edu but the investment business can pay a guaranteed payment and uh, and, and do that. Now, is 199A applicable to trading partnerships, uh, Harmeet? It depends on the income because it excludes capital gains. And so it depends on how you're trading and what you're trading. But the, the answer is probably going to be a big no on that one. But we can always use the, uh, the other. So we could pay the management fees. We can get money into that thing. Other areas that were affected is the entertainment expense. And I'm going to listen to you guys all collectively start to cry because um, – and, and by the way, someone just says, can my C-Corp elective pay uh, fringe benefits instead of wages? The answer is wages and fringe benefits are still compensation. So you got to put it under its big heading, compensation. And the answer is yes. I've sat on many a, a nonprofit board where my sole benefit was fringe benefits from the nonprofit. I get to go do the, the uh, uh, what do we do? We had a big gala in one of them every year. It was a big gala. The other one, we did a golf tournament. Uh, some of them, they just, they just fly you around to come to the meetings and stuff like that. Um, yes. So yes, you can pay just that. Entertainment expenses are gone though. We can no longer write off entertainment expenses. Gone. Zip. Zilch. And if you're doing meals as entertainment, gone. You're no longer going to do entertaining clients. Hey, I took them out and entertained them. That's going to go out of your vocabulary. You're now going to have business meetings with, with clients, and that's what you're going to do. Then you have a 50% deduction, but they really, that's painful. Doesn't that stink? Enter, entertainment move to marketing, research, and development. Uh, you, <laughs> orange jumpsuit, Lauren, orange jumpsuit, right? You got to make sure that these things are going to pass muster. Now, if it's a directly related entertainment expense, so I am in the nightclub business, and I go to excess down at the wherever that is, I think it's at the Wynn or one of those, the Encore uh, in Vegas, and I am in that business, then I could write that off, but it has to be related to my business, directly related. Gone is the affiliated uh, entertainment expense. Um, somebody just asked, in my previous structure, does all money come from the C-Corp and can the holding company pay the owner? I'm not certain I completely understand that, but you can have the expenses are all coming out of the C-Corp and can the holding company pay the owner? Yes. Of course it can. Um, what if I have a public relations and production company in Hollywood? Then, Wendy, I will leave that to you. Uh, absolutely, if it's directly related to your business, then you would be able to. Uh, what's the line between entertainment and promotional activity like buying show tickets for clients and contests? Now, that's a great one, Lan. Um, and what you can do there is if I give show tickets to my employees or if I give them to a prospect, that is an expense because I am giving them something of value. They would have, in theory, a taxable event to them. So like if I bought Le Cirque tickets to all of, uh, you, know, you know, bought a, let's say, if, if you guys know Cirque du Soleil, you know, they're sometimes $200 tickets, right? If I, I buy $400 of the tickets for, for uh, one of my employees, technically that's a taxable event to them. I cannot just give them stuff. I would get to write it off 100%. They would have to recognize it as income. If I give that stuff to clients, 
um, you're going to write it off as a uh, advertising activity. They're supposed to recognize it, but I doubt you. I doubt anybody will. Um, what if you have a business meeting, including a meal with a possible client? Um, that would just be a business meal. Again, you have to have an expecta uh, expectation um, of a profit. And so it says, can you give show tickets to an employee as a benefit for a nonprofit? Uh, again, it's it's not deductible to the nonprofit. Um, it would be taxable to the employee uh, unless it's part of the nonprofit activity. So like, uh, there is an exception for when you can write off certain types of things. Like if your company sponsors a nonprofit charity event, like a, a golf scra scramble or things like that, I believe it can still write those things off. Um, what if a company incentive uh, trips is bonus and how is that? taxable. If you're doing trips, then it depends on what they're doing on the trip. If you're just giving them a trip to Cancun for purely personal reasons, you're going to have a problem. Uh, the chances are they're going to end up paying tax on the value of the, of, of the trip. If you're doing it as a, hey, we're going to go to the company meeting and we're going to have uh, events while we're there and it's, and it's part of a kind of a working uh, and they go to seminar, then yes, uh, it depends on where it's at. But if it's like Cancun, actually it's North American um, region, you're going to get to write that stuff off. If you start sending them to France, uh, no, you're going to have a little more of an issue. Um, guys, I love tax stuff, and we're going to be talking about this stuff all night. I think of, uh, I'm thinking we're going to be going a little long here, so I apologize. Uh, going, going, gone, the salt limitation. Why is this a big one? Well, this is kind of fun. Uh, New York sued along with everybody else. Uh, there was four states that sued. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. I like just to pull things up because I like to be annoying. Uh, somebody wrote, uh, the lawsuit of pure publicity stunt is so frivolous and, and unserious, it may, it may as well have been written in crayon. <laughs> I like that. Uh, even some of the liberals don't like this. They said this is one of the stupidest lawsuits in the Trump era. And the University of Iowa law professor uh, Andy Gruel wrote, if this lawsuit succeeds, I will post a video of myself eating every single page of the Internal Revenue Code one by one. There's over 20,000 pages, guys. He's going he's gonna to be bloated if he does that. Um, Hopefully, hopefully they, they're not going to win. It's just one of those things. The state's trying to show their constituents how, how serious they are. And the question you're going to say is, why is this such a big deal? Well, again, numbers don't lie. What we look at is, is, is how many people are actually uh, writing off the state and local taxes and how much. And so here's the average from the, the Tax Policy Institute. Um, New York was the average uh, size of the deduction was 21,000 and 34% of its people were actually claiming it. Um, the big percentages, like look at Maryland, 45% of its people actually had the deduction. And then all of these guys are gonna be capped at 10,000. So it may not seem like a huge amount, but just imagine you're having an expense that you don't get to write off. And more importantly, you're, you're, you're just gonna be taking the standard deduction. It's gonna be like 90% of taxpayers aren't gonna get any benefit for the money that they're paying to their state. How long do you think it's gonna be before people figure that one out? and start yelling at their state, saying, I'm giving you money after tax. I'm giving you money and I get zero benefit, zero relief. And uh, somebody says $10,000 per property, it's your individual. You're hitting the nail on the head, Alexa. This is what's so beautiful. This is how I want you guys to start thinking from here on out. If I have a, if I have a limitation, my $10,000 limitation is for me as an individual. It does not affect business property. I write that off against the income of the business property. And you want to get really, really technical? If I want to, I can, use, I can allocate what portion of my house, and don't, don't buy into this, the IRS's preferred way. There's like nine different ways you can write off a home office. And they always say, oh, calculate your square footage and look at the whole square footage of the house. No, that's the best for the government. That's the way they tell you to do it. There's other ways. You could just say how many rooms are in my house. Let's say you have six rooms and one of it is dedicated to business. Your corporation could literally reimburse you for the business use, the exclusive and frequent use of that room as your administrative office on behalf of that company. And you don't have to declare it as taxable income. You don't have to worry about depreciation, but you get to write it off. And the calculation does include the depreciation, also includes portion of the mortgage, portion of the utilities, portion of all those things, including the property taxes. So let's say you're at property taxes and you're about $12,000. This is how you manage to get the money into your pocket to make it deductible. 
you might only get to write off 10, but your business may be picking up the other two. And again, this is the stuff we teach all the time. This is what would be called a reimburse. This is under an, an accountable plan. You ha and you can do this, Becky, uh, even if you're renting, because we would take the rent value. You're still coming out of pocket after tax to pay for that property. The way to look at this is when you have a corporation in the mix, you are now an employee of that organization. And it's no different than if you worked for Microsoft. And Bill Gates said, Becky, I want you to work from home sometimes. I need you to have a computer. I need you to have internet. I need you to have a cell phone so I can call you at 10 o'clock at night because it's very important what you're doing. You need to do your administrative services at home. In fact, in many of our businesses, they're sited in a different state. And so the place that you're doing all your administrative activities is gonna be in your home, maybe you're in Georgia. And you say, all right, I have, a, I have an office area. This is my dedicated office area. I'm going to use the computer. I'm going to use the phone. I'm going to use all these things. Now, the employer doesn't get to use all those things for free. It can reimburse you. And so the way it works is you have basically three choices. Normally, people would just say, oh, I'm not going to get reimbursed. I'm just going to write it off on my personal tax. and It'll go on your Schedule A. That's out the door now. The other route is they say, hey, I'll charge my company or charge my employer rent for that portion. Well, now you have a taxable event. You have to recognize the rent and, it's in their, and they're paying it to you and you're getting to depreciate it. It's gonna be a, a circle. If it's your own employer, you're paying yourself money just as compensation, it's silly. Plus, you're gonna have depreciation recapture when you sell the house. Same thing with the home office deduction. You get a, a depreciation recapture. The better way to do this is just to say, hey, employer, just reimburse me. Here's how big, here's, here's how much my house is. And you can do it two, two or three different ways. My favorite way is to use either usable square foot, which means I exclude the bathrooms and the kitchen and, and I, get rid of, um, I get rid of things like my garage. And I just look at the usable square footage and I say, how much of that am I using? What portion? Or I just say, how many houses do I have? Or how many rooms do I have? Let's say that I have six rooms and one of it's being used, then I would take one sixth, whatever that amount is, like probably 12, 30, whatever percentage it is. That's the amount of all my expenses that I get to write off. Plus, let's say I paint the room or put a picture up, I can write that off. Uh, or if I get it wired specifically so I have internet, uh, then I can do it. If the, if the sound is gone, try the other uh, mechanism. Everybody else can still hear. Um, just answering it somebody's question they're having some issues um, hearing um, yep everybody else can hear so yeah so try the phone or try uh, your computer again um, and this is true somebody has asked uh, there's no depreciation recapture with an accountable plan correct it does not affect you it is tax-free money that goes in your pocket um, does the C-Corp have to be a partner for LLCs no if, if, if it's in rental real estate you don't um, Anyway, so you get all this fun stuff. Somebody has said 203, I don't know what that means. But, uh, are you still account the bathrooms as part of your total rooms? Uh, no, you're gonna take a look at the total rooms of the house and that would usually mean um, four walls or three walls with, with, with an access point. So could you use a bathroom? I don't think you use the bathroom. I, 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 I've never used the bathroom, but again, you run which scenario works best for you. So we looked at total square footage and we calculate how much space you're using or we use the number of available rooms in the house, uh, or you do usable square feet, whatever one's gonna get you the highest percentage, um, and you go that route. Can I rent personal property to my LP? No, what you have to be as an employee, and in order to be an employee, it has to be a separate taxpayer. That is, uh, uh, unfortunately, you cannot be an employee of a partnership in which you're a partner, so it has to be an S Corp or a C Corp. Um, that is just the way the rules go. All right, let's jump off. So you guys see how the impact is. Well, again, I'll get lost in tax all day long. Let's run some scenarios. This is uh, how much will you owe in 2018? If you make $100,000 in New York, you're gonna be an effective tax rate of 23.95. This is including your state, your uh, local, your FICA, and your federal. You're gonna be, that's your, that's your effective tax rate. They're gonna take 23, almost 24% of your stuff. If you were in Las Vegas with me, we don't have state and local taxes, yay! Then we're just gonna be paying 16. So just look at that difference. That's a big difference. The question is, do you get any tax relief for it? It even gets worse. And this is where you start looking at your state and local taxes. 
and you start realizing I'm capped at ten thousand dollars. Here's a New Yorker making two hundred grand, and we already know, as a matter of fact, without even looking at any other expenses, without looking at any other um, deduction that would be on your Schedule A, you're already capped. You're already losing o o over six thousand dollars of benefit. Your state and local taxes there are over seventeen thousand six hundred. You're already losing it. And then let's just compare that to. Again, our friend, uh, if you were living out in Nevada, look at that. It's 41,000 versus 59,000. I'm just going to kind of go back and forth just because it's fun to do. It's $59,000 of tax that you're going to pay in New York versus 41,000. It's a huge difference. It's not, it's not fair. It's stinkle, is, and that's why we call it tax mageddon. It's like if you're in one of those states, you're going to get hit unless you do something about it. And so that's where we're going to, we're going to come up with some final solutions here in a second of what you can do about it. And what it really comes down to is following what other people that have significant amounts of money do. Follow what they do. When you hear about it, when you read about it, don't get mad at them. Say, how did they do that instead? All right, next one. We already talked about the mortgage interest. Um, mortgage interest went from the um, 700, from the million down to the 750,000. And the bigger one is that it's, um, excuse me, it's only if you are, um, it's only acquisition indebtedness. Now this is a bigger one. And the next one that I'm gonna go into is one that's really near and dear to my heart. That is charitable giving. Um, this is where you're giving money only if you, only, only if you need it, are you gonna give the money to charitable giving. A lot of people give their money uh, in the, um, at, at the end of the year. In fact, I think December, about 20% of charitable bequeathments are made because people are looking at their tax bill and they're getting the most bang for their buck. Uh, they're anticipating that the actual uh, giving is in this country is going to decline by as much as 20 billion. It's estimated between 13 billion and 20 billion, depending on who you listen to. Uh, the answer or the question that you should be asking is why are they doing that? It's because right now the current cost of giving is about um, you're getting uh, about for a hundred dollars, it's really costing you 79 because you're getting a deduction for it. Hope that makes sense. If I give uh, $100 to a charity, it really costs me 79 because I'm getting $21 of tax benefit. That's the average right now. The estimate in 2018 is 86, which means if I'm giving 100 bucks, it's actually cost me 86, which means I have less money that I can give, all things being equal. Really tough. Really tough, kind of stinkolas. Um, and the charities are very much aware of this going on. Because if you're used to giving money, and all of a sudden you're not gonna get benefit for giving the money, you may be less inclined to, get, to give it. So what do we do? Well, my solution is to get lumpy with it. What that means is you lump up multiple years, and instead of giving $10,000 a year where I'm not gonna get a benefit, I'm gonna give $20,000 every two years or $30,000 every three years. And before you think I'm crazy, lots of people are starting to look at doing this. The other route is you give assets, big assets, once in a while, like, hey, I'm gonna, instead of giving cash, I'm gonna start giving things that have appreciated. I'm gonna give a house or a piece of land, or I'm gonna give a piece of art that's been in my family that's worth a lot. I'm just gonna give those things because I don't have to pay tax when I sell them. I'm just gonna give that to the charity and let it sell it. Um, somebody just says, I have an LP under C-Corp. Can I rent a commercial property I personally own to the C-Corp? Of course, Tracy. In fact, we encourage that. Um, the getting lumpy, there's another one, it's, um, gosh, a DAFI, a donor advised fund. You can actually give money to certain uh, brokerage companies. They have these things set up where uh, you're giving it in chunks to the brokerage house, but it's not going to the charity until you direct it, but you get the deduction the day that you put it in the, the donor advised fund. So if you are a prolific giver and you wanna keep giving, I'm just gonna say, you know what it might be better for you to do is just, you know, either really, you know, Borrow some money at the end of this year and just and just give your 20, 2019 a year in advance. As long as it's written before the end of the year, you're good. Maybe bite the bullet on it so you get some tax benefit. But let's actually run the numbers and see whether or not you're getting a, a good size tax benefit. So that you know maybe you're right on the threshold. You're right at 24 with your current charitable giving. Now every dollar above that, you get. You could, it's better to itemize. And so if I gave another $10,000, I'd get the full $10,000 of benefit out of my highest bracket. Um, 
you know, that, that type of thing is what we look at. Somebody just asked, is there a solution for salt? Well, the states are, the states are suing the, uh, what was funny is a bunch of states started trying to call their, uh, their income taxes, the state income taxes, charitable giving, uh, because the states are nonprofits it's, and they got shot down, the regs are nailing them. Uh, but they're trying to do all this again. Uh, somebody says, can we listen again from the website? Absolutely. Uh, I know I'm going fast is because I like to pack a lot of stuff in. I don't like a lot of fluff. I like to just get it into this and I could talk about this stuff. Like there are so many little areas that we could just keep digging into. What it's going to come down to is making it relevant for you. Um, and in order to make it re relevant for you, we're going to have to really look and see what things can impact you. So the three things the 2% do differently, the, the, and we're talking about the top two, um, the top 2% in the country. Um, Somebody just says, can corps give to charities and write off? Uh, uh, C corps can give up to 10% of their uh, net profits. S corps flow down to the individual uh, shareholders. Um, can a trading business, C corp, reimburse you for home use? Yes. Uh, I own a property with another person. Can I put one half in an LLC and a trust? Yes. Uh, and uh, here's everything else I think I've already answered. Where's the calculator, Billy? I don't know which calculator, but I have a calculator that I use, it's a really cool spreadsheet. If you wanna shoot me an email or respond, I'll actually type my email in here, guys. Um, a C Corp can give to charity, yes. Uh, let me see what I'm gonna do. How am I gonna do this? I'm just gonna put this in the chat. tmathis at alglaw.com. Feel free to shoot me an email if you want and I'll get you whatever I can. Um, if an S Corp rents personal residence for meetings, can we still have the Corp reimburse the office use? Now, here's where it gets fun. Carrie, I love you, but um, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. What we do is we carve off the, the exclusive use for the business, but then I can still rent the rest of the house to the company to have a corporate meeting once a month too. Yes, so we like to double dip, but we want to make sure that we're saying, hey, just the kitchen area with, you know, we want to be a little bit restricted if we don't want to sell it again. Uh, can C Corp reimburse me for one home office where my S Corp reimburse for a second office in the house? Uh, no, you're going to have a tough time with that one unless it's like really legit. We do get that popped up when we have somebody with a second property that they use only for their business. Then the answer is yes, but we want to document the heck out of that one. Uh, can you rent uh, the house or part of it for a meeting to an LLC? Yes, Eva, absolutely. Uh, and we encourage that. That's 280A subsection G2, where you can rent your house to your uh, company uh, up to uh, 14 days a year. And it's actually per resident, uh, though we say it's per taxpayer, just because we've never had guidance on that. Uh, we don't get crazy, but you basically, yes. And it, it doesn't just have to be your house. It could be your second house. It could be an RV, so long as it has a sleeping quarters and a head. Uh, it could actually be a boat, so long as it has those two things too. What about an e-commerce business? Yes, you could absolutely do that. Uh, even if it's taxed as a partnership and not a corp, uh, reading to an LLC. No, it has to be an S corp or a C corp. It has to be a separate taxpayer. And the way the IRS looks at it is in order to be a sex second taxpayer, it cannot be you as a partner, you as a sole proprietor. It has to be you as an employee with the employer. So it has to be an S or a C corp. All right, now we have to go down and we're gonna, this is the fun stuff. This is when we start talking about the rich folk and what they're doing. Of course, everybody's rich in their own way, but we're talking about the people that are making millions of dollars. And where do we find out what they do? We go to the IRS data book. If you guys have seen me speak on taxes, you see that I use this like crazy to see who gets audited and who doesn't. And then I make sure that we are the one who's the, uh, that, that's not <laughs> getting audited. Uh, and we've been very successful at that. We actually had a seven year stretch where we didn't have any audits. It was weird in the early, uh, I want to say what when was that? It was in the early 2000s where we thought maybe the notices were getting lost. Uh, we just nobody was getting audited. It was just so few people, um, which is weird when you think about it. Now it's like the average is about one percent. Um, if you're an S corp, it's a fraction of a percent. You really have to get do something to get audited. And then what I really look at is if they audit you, do they get any money out of you? And what you'll see is that if you are a sole proprietor, it's about a 94% chance that you're going to owe money after an audit. And you're going to get audited. Uh, let's say you're making 100000 I think it was 2.2 or 2.6 last year. Um, so if they audit you, you're going to pay. And if you're an S-corp, it's a fraction of a percent, and then it's about a 50-50 proposition as to whether you're going to owe money. 
So you tell me, 700% more likely to get audited, and when they audit you, it's almost uh, it's a 94% certainty you're going to owe more. Or do you want to have like almost no audits and rarely do you, like you know maybe maybe 50 50 shot you're going to owe money? I'm going to go on the on the latter of those two. So we go to the IRS uh, data book and we look and say what are the two percent doing differently? One of the things that I've noticed with the top taxpayers is that they structure their income differently than most people. In other words, they're not just making their money as W-2. In fact, it's 33 percent, 33 to 37 percent, depending on what year you're looking at. Um, you are is is active income. Everything else is coming from a, a passive sources. So investment income from rental. Uh, so it's rent, royalties, dividends, uh, capital gains, both short term and long term. Um, that's where they're looking at. And if I didn't say dividends, dividends is a big one. Um, the other thing you do is you, if you know somebody who's been very successful, is just kind of sit down and talk to them. And they're usually pretty. Um, pretty insightful when you're sitting there and you're talking to somebody like I, I, I use an example of a client who said um, hey because uh, I always tell people if you're gonna you, you know the stock market's not a place that you're gonna make a ton of money uh, you know play in the market unless unless you really have an eye towards value stocks and you're buying things that are gonna pay you and she said no my grandfather's retired off of his portfolio and that's what he does and I said well all I can tell you is my experience and my experience is that it's really tough to be a market timer unless that's what you do. Like if you do it full time and that's where you really spend your time, I get it. But I said, my, my hunch is that that's not the case with your grandfather because she said he traveled all the time. And sure enough, she went there um, and talked to her grandfather and the grandfather said, yeah, he, was, he bought uh, value stocks that were paying dividends. And his income was actually the dividends off the companies that he'd owned for 20 and 30 years. And he was able to live off of the profit, the dividends, just the profit paid out of the corporation. And it's funny because I always, I, you know, if you guys aren't aware, there's things called dividend kings, companies that have been increasing their dividends for 50 years or more. Uh, Warren Buffett made Coca-Cola famous. It's uh, not 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 in the sense of the uh, of New Coke or the or the great uh, the, the flavor of it or anything like that. It's it's he made it famous because he because he identified it early on as a great value stock, and it's been paying out increasing dividends for 56 years. Uh, in other words, it pays out its profits consistently, and every year it increases it. And it's been doing those increases for over 50 years. So it becomes a little different when you look at it. So you just kind of look at wealthy people and say, how are you structuring it? How are you setting this up to where you're not having to, to run around and do so much work? The other thing you do is you pay attention to the media. When the media starts railing on somebody for being wealthy and, and says, look what they did. Like, for example, right now we have a president that gets hammered every time I turn on the TV. And they say, look what he did here. And look how he's benefiting from these new tax laws. I'm going to say, rather than shoot him down, I'm going to say, what is he doing? What I know for a fact, like for, for Trump, is he has a foundation and he has a structure of entities passing through to his personal return. And he's carving off other income into corporations. He's controlling how much money he's actually going to have on his, on, on his tax return. And I'm sure that's why he doesn't want to show it to everybody, because he knows most people would understand. Hey, I'm making a hundred million dollars a year. Well, he's only showing probably, you know, he's probably showing a fraction of that. People are going to say, oh, you're not as rich as you said. Well, at, at the end of the day, what I care about is how much do I actually have to live off of? Um, the only time I'm really going to care about the income on my 1040 is if I'm trying to qualify for a loan. Um, now, the next one is uh, someone who advises wealthy people. Somebody says, hi, Maggie. Um, you, you talk to somebody who has a lot of wealthy clients. Um, you know, that's, that happens to be Anderson. We've got a lot of folks that do very, very well. Uh, we have a lot of folks that are in the middle, and we have some folks that are on the low end, too. It says, but, but what you do is if, if, you can, if you use the principles that the wealthiest people do, you will get similar results over the long haul. It's kind of like working out. When I first start working out, I don't really notice much of a difference. For the first two, three weeks, I may notice no difference until somebody walks up and says, have you been working out? And then you say, wait a second, I didn't notice any difference because the changes are so gradual. But if you do what wealthy folks do, you will get similar results. That's why I follow and watch them so closely when it comes to taxes, because I just care and I say, where are they going? Where are they getting their, their, their deductions? Where, how are they controlling things? And then you realize that there are very, uh, th there's a bunch of rules that they do tend to follow, and, th and this is what we kind of buy Bitcoin stock entry. I've known people that actually mortgage their house. I, over my like vehement objection, they, they mortgage their house to buy Bitcoin when it was at 19,000. Um, Bitcoin 
and I have a, I have a, I have a couple of good buddies that actually did the, the, the dumbass, yes. Uh, that's why we don't let donkeys go to school. Um, but I also have some folks that did the initial coin offerings. It's 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 amazing world, amazing world. They're, they're working inside of clubs, inside of some of the casinos, and uh, meaning that they have coins that actually give you access to to the clubs inside of the clubs, it's like private clubs. And people are snapping that stuff up. It's crazy. Uh, that to me though, that's not an asset. That's a that is a that is boomer bust. Um, all right. So what do the wealthiest folks do? They isolate risk and activities. What they do is they take whatever they're doing and they manage to isolate it. So if they have real estate, it's not going to be mixed in with their stock investing. If they have an active business, it's not going to be, it's not going to be uh, tied in and mixed in together with their investment real estate. They're going to isolate those things off. They also have an accountable plan and more importantly, they have a tax strategy. Generally speaking, they know where their money is going to go before they make it. And that's because they actually set something into place and they said, when I make it, where is it going to go? If you know that you have an accountable plan and you have lots of reimbursements, some people get mad at me and they're like, well, I have $20,000 of expenses I can reimburse, but I only have 10000 that's coming in. And I look at them and go, that's a great problem to have. You know where your money is going to go before you even make it. Now just go out and make some more money. And if somebody looks at you funny, you say, just work a little harder. You know, if you really want to, there's no reason why you can't go out, like, you know, get a second job if you have to. I'm just teasing. No, but, but like if you have a, if you have a company, uh, for example, a corporation, I've seen this happen so many times. Sometimes it's the side business that they start that ends up taking off. And I've seen that more often than I can count where somebody is, you know, let's say they're, uh, the example I use in some of the events is a stock trader was a gentleman and his kid got into the business, but we didn't want the kid because he was 18 and a little bit, uh, you know, he was a little bit of a partier. We didn't want him touching the stock account. So he did something else and he built a website and he ended up selling the website for close to a million dollars. And I always say like, that's the funny one within a year. So the, the, so the kid made a million bucks inside the entity because the dad had a tax appetite. And I always kind of laugh about that because I didn't think the kid like, he'd be like, don't let him anywhere near your trading account. He's scaring me because he was just, again, he was kind of a skater. Uh, um, you know, dude, we've had a bunch of those. We've had a guy uh, doing golf courses. We have a, a great one that was a, uh, a snowboarder. He's still out there getting sponsorships. But all these things were brought into the business just because they had a tax appetite. They had expenses. And they started saying, well, where else can I make a few dollars? That's a good problem to have, guys. If you have a whole bunch of expenses to reimburse, fantastic. You're not going to lose it. In fact, even if you don't take it, I could still show you a way to write it off. I don't like going into it, but it's called a 1244 stock loss. So I've done that too, where someone just had lots of losses and they said, well, can I just take the tax benefit? Yes, there's a way to do it, but I don't like to do that. That's like the exception. Um, and then the other thing they do is they create their own dynasties. What they do is they create something that, that somebody can't destroy. The example I'm going to use is very recently, the, the founder of Ikea passed away. His kids did not get Ikea. His kids got two board seats out of seven, but the rest of it went into nonprofits. I like that because nonprofits don't die. Nonprofits aren't owned. It's really tough to kill a nonprofit and they don't pay tax. So you can actually create a nice family dynasty. Whenever you see the Clinton Foundation, you hear about the Trump Foundation, you hear about all these people and the Gates Foundation and Warren Buffett giving billions of dollars and all this stuff. There's a reason they're doing it, guys. And you can either sit there and question it and say, that sounds really fishy. Or you could say, why are they doing it? And how do I do it? And it, usually it comes down to this point number three is they want to create something. They have enough money. It's not money that's the issue anymore. Is they want to create something that's going to live beyond them that somebody can't destroy. Because believe it or not, when I talk to the truly wealthy, one of their biggest fears is giving their kids something that they're not prepared for or exacerbating an issue, saying like, oh, my son well, he's married to somebody and I'm worried that if he gets a whole bunch of money, that that's going to be the end of their relationship. And so it's like, hey, rather than give them money, give them something to do. And that is one of the things they do. They create their own dynasty. Here's quick lessons learned. This is a basic one. If And this is just from years of doing this and working with people and looking at their tax returns and seeing who makes money and who doesn't. Businesses earn money, they spend it, and they pay taxes on what's left. Whereas individuals earn money, pay taxes, and spend what's left. It's, just, it's a subtle difference, but it makes all the difference in the world when you talk about long-term investing. The best example I can give you is how businesses are treated under this new tax law is the corporate tax rate is 21, top, top tax rate is 21%. 
and you get a 20% deduction on qualified business income. Anything that passes through to you, you can qualify for, a, for basically writing off 20% of that income right off the top. There's a bunch of bells and whistles that come with it, but that's the difference between a business. Versus individuals, you have a 37% top bracket and you have limited itemization. They took away a bunch of stuff from you. So like if you can't figure that one out, it used to be the highest corporate tax rate was 39%, now it's 21. They gave you, they literally cut it in half. And what did they do to the individual? They gave you a 2% off the top and then they took away a bunch of your deductions and they're gonna force you to do the standard deduction. Again, 13 million people are gonna do the itemized versus what was it, 30 or 43, 43 million. They literally just took all your deductions away and said, and everybody thanked them. Uh, can my C escort pay my uh, personal phone bill or should I pay from personal account and reimburse? Uh, I like to see the reimbursement. So you just wanna have a reimbursable plan. We, if we did your entities, we already put it in place. All right, so let's do one final example then I'll show you guys where you can get more information. Um, this is like the example of somebody who has some real estate holdings, some investments holdings, see their kids over here. Where's my little pen? I gotta find my little pen because I like to draw circles around stuff. There we go. So we have the kids, here's mom and dad sitting over here. Um, they have their real estate holding entity. Uh, here they have their, this, let's just say this is a C Corp and they have their investment business as a 1065. Let's just walk through this, how this looks. Um, top bracket on the corporation is 21%. So we already know we have another tax bracket that we can share with. And so if I make a whole bunch of money, uh, I don't have to have it hit my personal tax right away. I might want to just kind of shelter that for a while. Um, my real estate, all these guys are, are holding up into that holding company. So if real estate one makes a bunch of money, two breaks even and three loses a little, that's the net that I'm worried about. I get my depreciation and everything else. But if I have a bunch of extra and I don't want it to flow under my personal return, I can pay it up to the corporation and a management fee. And guess what? QBI, I get a 20% deduction so long as I qualify. You know for sure that you qualify if your taxable income is below 157,500 as a single person, or if you're mar married, it's 315,000. You don't have to worry about anything else. If your taxable income, not your adjusted gross income, but your taxable income, and this is after we get uh, all of our deductions to our retirement plans and everything else, even giving money to the charity, like that we can give money to the charity to lower my taxable income so I qualify for this. Yes, you can. Um, people, yes, yeah, actually you can. Um, you can actually decide at the end of the year, because I do this, and I say, how much money do I want to pay to the charity? I have a charity, and I give money at the end of the year, every year. As long as I write the check before the end of the year, I can just take it right off the top, and then my taxable income is what gets adjusted. So I can actually... Um, it seems like the government is incentivizing creating corporations. Yes, they have been for a long time. It's been years that they've been doing that. It, it, it is a completely different world when you go into corporation. Uh, here, we'll go back into this. Um, I love stuff like this, by the way, is when you have a little structure like this, then I get to decide, do I have to give money? No, but they just increased my adjusted gross income. It went from 50% to 60%, guys. If I make $500,000 of adjusted gross income. How much can I give to charity? I, this could be my own charity. So if I have 500,000 and I don't qualify for diddly squat, I can give 300,000, 60%. And now my taxable income is 200,000 and I get to qualify for the QBI. So I even get more deduction on my rental real estate. And everything else, I'm just running into my corporation if I feel like it. I'll go back to this so you guys can see it. Uh, what happens if my income is above 315? It depends on the type of business. If you are in the professional services, you're toast, you're done. You don't get any QBI. If you are in any other type of business where it's not on the reputation, skill, accounting, tax, or anything like that, uh, law, medical, if it's not in those fields, then they do a test of the greater of uh, 50% of the W-2 income that's being paid out of that entity or 25% of your W-2 plus 2.5% uh, of your uh, assets put into it. Like it's a calculation, you don't wanna get into this. Uh, somebody says, you gotta look at crypto. I know the crypto, I like crypto and I know how it's taxed. Uh, we need to uh, take a look at that. We could, we could take a look uh, at it, of course. Uh, will pharmacy fall under medical? Yes. 
Um, they're just giving out us all the proposed regs, but everything looks like it is. And then before you listen to these crazies that go out there and say, hey, you can bifurcate it, you can have, uh, you know, you could have a portion of it that's the pharmacy, but then we'll make another company that, 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 that is moving the money out of the pharmacy and, you know, we're going to take your pharmacy business, we're going to separate it. Nope, if it's, they're going to aggregate it together, they're going to treat it as the same. Uh, qualified business income. QBI means qualified business income. It is a 20% deduction on flow through qualified business income. Uh, it sounds like we need to do that class too. And we will. Um, and now I'm just going to say, how do you learn more? Well, one of the things that we do uh, is Tax Tuesdays. It's about every other week. Uh, and by the way, guys, we're probably going to do one in Spanish here coming up. Uh, I'm just being annoying. Uh, but I have so many clients from all over the world, and a lot of them speak Spanish. And Sometimes it's fun. We have a bunch of Spanish speaking accountants. So we'll end up doing that too. So if you're somebody who has any trouble with the technical speak, uh, then that'll be fun. Otherwise, I do this about every other week. Um, for a long time, it was uh, Ronnie Withager, but I'm doing it now. Uh, we did this last week. It was a lot of fun. They're fast moving. It's any questions you could throw out there. And then we're going to come up and, and uh, we're going to post uh, a few questions that we get from, I think it's webinar at Anderson Advisors dot com. If you can read my uh, handwriting, uh, webinar at Anderson Advisors. If you send in a tax question, then uh, we will make sure that we are um, uh, answering it. And if it's uh, there's a whole bunch of good ones, um, then we will go through those. Uh, all right. So someone says, did you see my question? I'm here in Spanish. Yeah, I see a bunch of, I know that I get this. I get this all the time where I'm having conversations with people. And I'm like, Hey, Toby, how would you like it? Um, you know, let's see, what do I have? I'm going to try to find your question. I have hundreds of questions that came in during this event. So if I missed your question, I apologize. There's quite a few. I don't think we're going to have time to go over because we're about 20 minutes over as it is. Uh, we will record this, and then we do record the Tax Tuesday as well. Uh, topic 701. I don't know what that is, Crystal. Um, uh, give me a give me an idea. Here, I'm going to go through a few others of where we can continue to learn more. Uh, where is it? There we go. The Tax Wise Workshop. I teach a two-day workshop. Uh, you can always come to that. We're going to go over at least 25 different tax strategies, maybe more. Um, the tax wise workshops, if you come out to them, most of you guys, if you're platinum, you're going to get tickets. I think you get tickets every quarter. Uh, so it should be free for you as long as you register and actually show up. Uh, if you want continuing uh, education, a lot of our courses are, um, uh, qualified for both continuing legal education and qualified uh, education for accounting. Uh, you just let us know. And uh, the next one, the other place that you can learn more, if you want to actually go through, oops, the, uh, here we go, where did it go? There we go. If you want to do a tax strategy on our website, you can go to our tax section and you can always fill out a request uh, to go through a, 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 a quick consult where we can start looking at it. What I want to do though, and more than likely is get you into our tax department. And if you're already in our tax department, then, then just say, Hey, I need to um, I need to have a tax review done, and I need to look at what uh, I, whether I'm going to be impacted, um, but uh, by these new tax laws, and we can do we can do some studies. Now, here's the caveat to all of this: is these tax laws they still haven't given us the guidance on it? We got guidance last night on a portion of it, but we still don't have the guidance on every section. So um, some of this stuff is going to be um, hey, we're going to have to play a little bit by ear. I'm, our guys are really good, and I'm pretty good about saying, hey, this is how I think. I'm 90% certain we're going to take the most conservative route, but they may they may do a little, a little tweaky on us. And if you guys know how we are, we tend to follow the black letter as opposed to the gray areas. I want to see the black letter of the law, and then you would keep everybody out of trouble. Um, let's see. Can't, hope you can do a webinar on platinum again. Single member trading, stock options, getting married this year. So. Hey, we, uh, I did do a big trading one. I did it for a group, so we can always give you the recording on that. I actually did a three-hour uh, webinar uh, live stream on it, on just on taxation for you future traders, your Forex, stock traders, option traders, and uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, is a 501c3 a corporation? If so, is it a C? It is a 501c3, and it can give benefits as well. In fact, this is what's beautiful. Um, 
is a lot of you guys, if you have employees in your other business and, and everybody tells you, hey, you can't actually do your medical reimbursement, the way around that is actually to open up your own uh, nonprofit and actually get involved in your community and start doing cool stuff. And then it can actually give you a medical reimbursement. And the reason being is because nobody owns it. Um, it's kind of fun if you guys like that sort of thing. I like that sort of thing. All right, so here's our agenda. What is itemizing? Why is it important? We went over that. What is the single most devastating tax law change? Um, we said traders, but it's for everybody. Uh, tax law change. Um, you guys get to decide that. And then the, the three things that the uh, uh, top 2% do differently. A lot of you guys are already doing that. Um, and where can I learn more to see what I can do? Uh, you guys now have a whole bunch of it. Somebody asked a question. It was about the uh, uh, foundation uh, and a nonprofit. And okay, so a foundation is a is a technical term for someone who doesn't do anything with their nonprofit. In other words, it's not doing anything other than giving money to other nonprofits, and it has to give five percent of its assets away. And there's lots of little rules with it. It has to give uh, five percent to another 501c3. A 501c3 is generally speaking, it's going to be a corporation. The way that I do them, they're all corporations, but it could be a trust, kind of like the Hershey Trust uh, that we started off, the, owns a big chunk of the Hershey publicly traded company. So a 501c3 is a corporation, but it's not a C corporation, but it is treated like a, C, uh, like a business for benefits. It could actually do the same uh, benefit plans for its employees, but just remember, a 501c3 does not, not pay taxes and it can receive money from third parties that they deduct as a charitable donation and then it goes on to that schedule a so now you're starting to see that everything is like it's like pulling a string so everything's affected so if i'm going out and i set up a 501c3 to do let's say affordable housing i'm doing hud hud properties i'm doing uh, houses for people that are uh, veterans or single moms, whatever. I'm doing something that would be considered a charitable activity. And I, I go to somebody and say, please give me money. I have to be cognizant that they may not get any benefit from giving us that money if they are using the standard deduction. Um, you really want them to uh, get a benefit out of it. So you're going to ask them to give you a big chunk of money, maybe give you a house and say, take a big, huge write-off once in a while and then just give it to me periodically. Every five years, give me something. You know, that's the type of thing you're going to do. Or you fund it yourself. But you actually have to be doing something that, that, that's a charitable activity. Now, if you're doing that, a charitable activity, then you are an operating charity. You're no longer a foundation. You're considered an operating, uh, operating charity, and you do not have to give your money away. You can actually hoard the money. Uh, so the example that we like to give is the Hershey Company, since I used it earlier, started in, what, 1905. Uh, Milton Hershey passed away a few decades later. No kids. It's worth $12.6 billion now and educates 2,000 kids a year, owns a hospital, owns a bunch of stuff in Lancaster County, and uh, just, just some amazing things. And it just continues to grow and grow and grow. There's no retained earnings. There's no tax on that stuff. So it's actually pretty cool. So anyway, I uh, don't know how I got off on that one. I think somebody kept asking uh, tax questions. All right. So I have a few more questions, then we're going to get rolling. Uh, somebody's asking about crypto. Crypto is not a currency. Crypto is a capital asset. So when you buy and sell crypto, it is treated like uh, selling stock. And if you buy something with cryptocurrencies, it's like selling the stock, turning it to cash, then buying it. So you actually have a capital gain event. You have a taxable event, and then you actually have basis. Uh, and then the uh, you have something taxed. But I, I have a bunch of stuff on the crypto stuff. So I appreciate that. And uh, then another question, if we wholesale property in the San Francisco Bay Area with the new laws, how would the income be taxed if done in our personal name versus C-Corp versus LLC member versus LLC taxes? Uh, corp. So if it flows onto your personal return, either as a single member or as a partnership, it's going to be treated as active ordinary income at the flip. You're a dealer. If it's a C corp, it's going to be taxed at 21%. Um, and then you can expense it if you, whatever you want to do. And if uh, the LLC is taxed as a C corp, same thing. LLCs do not exist to the IRS. The I LLC tells the IRS how they should view it. So an LLC could be taxed as a disregarded entity. It could be taxed as an S corp. It could be taxed as a C corp. It could be taxed as a partnership. You tell the IRS how to look at it. Uh, how do we re-listen to this? We will send you out the recording. 
I'll be posting it somewhere and I'll make sure you guys all get copies of it. Uh, glad to spend some time with you. I think we said we were going to do this for an hour. I think we're half an hour over, but uh, never been accused of being brief. Thanks again, guys, for uh, for hanging out with us. I uh, really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, always feel free to uh, shoot us an email. And uh, if you have more questions, actually ask them. The best thing to do, I'm going to put this back up. Um, I'm not sure if I have uh, the, the writing on it. But uh, webinar, there we go, webinar at Anderson Advisors. Send in your questions. The better, the harder, the better, so that we can answer them um, during our Tax Tuesday. I like to, I'm going to start trying to post those ahead of time, too, so you get to see ahead of time what's coming out. And uh, we'll catch you in the funny papers. Bye, guys.